verse 12. Just, just as I'm walking through this, you're going to pick up on a theme pretty quick. But there's also this. It's not too late. God's personal message. Come back to me and really mean it. Come fasting and weeping. Sorry for your sins. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God. You're God. And here's why. God is kind and merciful. He takes a deep breath, puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophes. Now, I like this because he's coming out of the message and Joel's speaking from what revelation understanding that he has here. But he's talking about how that if we come back to him, that, God, that, that God's waiting for us. So we're picking up a little bit of a mercy here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. By, by the time you found Joel, I'm in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Yeah, Joel's in your sticky pages. You ain't even going to find it. Let's get over to Hebrews. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 14. See, and then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, that is hold fast our uh, profession, or what we confess. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he feels what we feel, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. If I say mercy, mercy, and find grace to help at a time of need. So again, we're talking about mercy. Joel says, if you come back to me, you repent, you turn around, I'll take you back. I'll cancel out catastrophes in, in your life and around you. Hebrews tells us that he sets as a high priest before us, handing out pardons as we've talked about the last couple of weeks. And so we start seeing this, that this is the kind of God he is. Now, even though... It wasn't portrayed so much until we saw Jesus in the flesh. We, we didn't understand exactly who God was. But Samson picked up on something. We know about Samson's life. Samson was a man born of good parents. Sometimes good parents, and I'll use this lightly, it almost looks like a bad seed where a kid just goes crazy. And so uh, if you can't really look at his parents and blame him, but Samson... He had some things. He, he took a vow. His parents took a vow for him when he was young not to cut his hair, not to drink, not to drink strong drink. What was it? it seemed like there was three of them. Cut his, cut his hair, strong drink, something else. I'm sure it has to do with women. Uh, I'll just throw that out there because I, I, I forget what it was. But I know the first two were right because it always got him in trouble that, when he got to drinking. It always got him in some trouble. So we know what happened to Samson. He was, he was involved with Delilah. And after that, he went through a blind and they blinded out his eyes. And he had been a, a great judge for uh, Israel. And the scripture says, and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. Remember me. I pray you and strengthen me. I pray you. Only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, I've heard people preach as if Samson went to hell because of his life. I can't believe that because the book of Hebrews tells me he's in the, he's in the hall of faith. Amen. He's in that uh, hall of fame, if you would, of a believer who, uh, who loved, loved God. And at the end, but, but of course, there was the issue with his eyes here. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with the right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon uh, the lords there and upon all the people that were therein. So the, so the debt which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. In other words, double the victory even in his death. Verse 28 in that same chapter says, O Lord, remember me and strengthen me one more time. In other words, he knew that God came upon him when he picked up a jawbone and he whooped the Philistines, when he grabbed the, the gates of a city and brought him up on a high place. This was a man that was used of God in a great way. And when he gets near the end of his life and he realizes that he's done wrong, he said, remember me. Remember me. Then we find that Jonah does almost the same thing. That Jonah ran from God. He ends up in the belly's, uh, in the belly's well. In the whale's belly. In the well. So y'all better pay attention. I'll be off tonight. Amen. And there, of course, he three days there. He, then he begins to pray. And he realizes he's going to come out of the well one way or another. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, and he began to pray. He faced himself somehow toward Jerusalem, and he prayed, and the well threw him up. In other words, what I'm saying to you is he got another chance, just like Samson did. Then if I look at uh, Peter, as we've talked about over the last uh, month, when Peter cut off Malchus's ear, he should have died. He, they, the swords are out. Somebody should have killed him, but Jesus said, put up your swords, healed Malchus's ear. Peter got a second chance. What I'm saying is if you walk through the Scripture, it's not hard to recognize that Jesus was the same man in his death as he was in his life. As he's heading toward the cross, we realize that uh, in John chapter 19, verse 6, as soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, 
You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. I think we talked about that last week where Jesus sent as a pardon, giving out pardons. You remember he said, I am the Son of God, and I will be sitting at the right hand of, 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 the, of the Almighty God. And that was enough for them. So here's what they're saying. That this man has broken this law. We have this law. He claimed to be the son of God. He needs to die. Then Pilate heard this. He was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. When Jesus makes this statement, unless my dad had turned, you over, or turned me over to you, you had had no power against me. There's no way you could do anything. From then, now, that had to just, you know, for a man like Pilate who thinks he's all that, that had to set him back just a little bit. Then from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. And that's funny to hear the Jews tell somebody you're no friend of Caesar because none of them were friends of Caesar. They all hated Caesar. They hated the Roman rule over them and the thumb of the Romans over them. Then Pilate heard this. He brought Jesus out, set him down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. So now he's in the court in Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And he asked, shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked, we have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Again, it's amazing of the strange bedfellows here, how the people have begun to connect with one another who disliked one another over the, the, the death of Christ. Matthew 27 says, now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. Now you could die 51 weeks out of the year, but if you happen to, to draw the lottery, and land on that 52nd uh, week of Passover, then somebody's going to get to go free. So Jesus happened to land, of course, on Passover weekend. He's there with uh, three other men, Barabbas and those two thieves. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy. And I, I wrote this for you. I want you to see it out of envy. Envy is the feeling of displeasure produced by witnessing or hearing of the advantage or prosperity of others. That's envy. When people see that you're being blessed, that you're prosperous, when you touch something, it, 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 it turns to gold, or you got the favor of God on you, envy can come in. It, it's neither gender. Amen. It can get on anyone, and they can get on children too. So you have to fight this little devil all the way. It's different from jealousy. Jealousy desires to have the same or the same sort of thing for itself. So they handed Jesus over for envy on top of that. Now listen, I understand jealousy too. As a preacher, sometimes you see big churches or ministries that are rocking and stuff, and you can get a little jealous of other ministers. And one of the things you have to fight as you're moving through life is you got to compliment them. You, got, you can't compete with them. you got to thank God for them. you got to lift them up because I've been to the top and I've been to the bottom. I've been in the middle. I just like being in. Amen. I just want to be in the gospel. I just want to stay at this thing. So while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him his message. How many know when she talks, you need to listen? So she's going to talk to him. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. That must have been some kind of nightmare. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all yelled, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Then Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was started. He took water, and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. Now, I, I studied some history, and I, I read somewhere where Pilate actually died washing his hands. Guilt is a terrible thing to live with. And he lived with the guilt of Christ's crucifixion and the death, anointing the innocent man. He washed his hands, but there's there that thing where he just kept on washing them. And every time they saw Pilate wash his hands extra, they knew what he was thinking about the day that Christ died. 
When Pilate saw that he was getting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, that his blood be on us and on our children. Let's stop a minute and talk. We read Sunday that as Jesus was going through the crowd, that Simon of Cyrene took his cross for him. And as he's going through the crowd, Jesus stops for a moment and he speaks to the women. Before he gets to the cross, he speaks to the women. And he says, woe to you who have children in the last days or the, or in the next. He doesn't even give a time. But he says, Jerusalem will be a desolation. The city's going to be surrounded. All of these things. So when the people say this, when they said his blood be on us and on our children, they're pronouncing a curse on themselves. They're saying, okay, in other words, let our kids take the responsibility of what we're doing here today. And sure enough, it was on them and it was on their kids. And, of course, cannibalism turned in. They, they, they took over the city two to four years. Titus and Vespasian, uh, the, the Romans seized it. Jerusalem was in, in utter destruction. That, that's why we, we read all the time about Jerusalem being rebuilt. Because it's a city that always seems to be under violence. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now let's talk. There was a custom. The scripture said there was a custom. We all have customs in our life. Some of you have customs as family. Uh, Thanksgiving, I bet the, the Hicks custom is a great big bunch of turkeys to feed all them turkeys that come over to your house. Amen. That there's a custom that takes place. You have customs in Mexico. They have customs here. Uh, they, have, he had a, they had a custom among their people. And they said it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd to allow sometimes a majority. Mo, I say a lot of times the majority ain't right, especially when it's a mob rule. And so there's that, that releasing, the yelling of the people. There were two reasons why they wanted to release him. First, political pressure, to keep the Jews happy, therefore to avoid a riot. I'm, I'm sorry, to crucify him. So they try to keep the Jews happy. That political pressure, it's amazing what it does, isn't it? We'll get, wait, wait another 14 months and watch what happens. The political pressure is going to start rising in America. And everybody's going to be thinking about certain rights being taken away. And, and what if this one becomes elected? And, and how will that uh, affect us? And how will it affect our, our economy? How, how about our health? And how about our children, our education? All these things, all that pressure comes on you. Then second, Pilate, believing Jesus was innocent, saw this as a way of perhaps getting him freed. He, was going to take, he had to pick out of the three. Uh, one of the most notorious, and he figured if I pick the bad guy, surely they'll pick up Barabbas and they'll, they'll let Jesus go free. Because if you look at these four guys, you got, you got three thieves. One of them's a leader. As a leader, he's killed a man. Uh, he, he's caused insurrections. He's called rev, uh, revolts or what would got a start of a revolution. He tried that. So here, surely Jesus would be the innocent one and they let him go. Didn't happen. It backfired. The criminal the scripture called him Barabbas, notorious. Uh, Episcopan, which means to mark upon, as is a marked man, public enemy number one. He would be the guy with the tattoos on him, with, with the teardrops coming down his eyeball, telling everybody that I've killed X amount of men. This is my life. This is who I am. But you can't hardly blame him. Let me just take up for Barabbas a little bit. They're, 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 they're being put down as a Jewish nation. They're being uh, 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 persecuted. The religiously, rights have been taken away. He's tired of what he's seeing among the religious part of the Jews, giving in to the Romans, Romans all the time, fattening their purses. So he's involved in what is called, and, and uh, there was actually a couple movies on just lately uh, about the Saqqara. The Saqqara is literally um, hit men. And that is actually the word used for Barabbas and the two men with him. They were hit men. They were, they were a part of that. His name means son, bar, Abba, father, son of the father. When you get a name put on you, and my kids have always understood that the names I gave them had, had significant importance to it. I know you, David, you've worked on that. Josiah, your name also has significance. There's something about having a significant name. There's something about naming something with significance. Because your hope and prayer is that they'll live up to that name or they'll understand and catch that name. Josiah was the youngest king uh, of Israel, uh, and he, he brought righteousness into the land. I named my son after that na name, too. These are things I named Judah, Judah Benjamin. Uh, Judah is loud. Benjamin is uh, left-handed or, or ambidextrous wolf boy. Uh, carnivorous, just can't get enough. And who knows, I, I, I picked the right name, loud, and just can't get enough. He's that, that's my boy. You know, but, but hopefully there's a spiritual side that's going to flip in their lives. That's my hope and prayer. So Barabbas, when they named him that, son of the father, he was saying, whoever his dad was was saying, this is going to be the, my son. This is a guy I'm proud of. It could have been his dad was well known. His first name may have been Jesus, according 
to Dr. William Wilson, a scholar. Uh, this would have given the reason Pilate said Jesus, who is called the Christ. In other words, uh, Barabbas, Jesus, or Jesus, who is called the Christ. He, he, he differentiated. Now, he, here's the thing. His crime was a, a political revolutionary, uh, a man named Barabbas who was in prison with the insurrection, according to Mark 15, who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate, to do for them what he usually did, possibly, again, the member of the Sicarii. Uh, and when you look at this, and uh, if I could get you, uh, Justin, would you help me out? Would you do me a favor? I want you to walk in that room and close the door. And just tell me what you hear. Okay? That's all I want you to do. I don't want you sticking your ear up to the door. Just go to the other side of the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I do that when people don't pay attention. No, I'm kidding. You know Justin pays attention. There's a uniqueness to this story that I've always loved. I found it years ago. And that was that in the movies, you've always seen Jesus and Pilate. You've always seen uh, Barabbas there. But in reality, uh, the honesty is that these men were so notorious, they were not brought out among the crowd. People knew who he was. They were in a fortress known as Antonia, which is about a half a mile away. So if you understand where they were and the significance of where he was, He's not able to hear Pilate talking. Pilate doesn't have a, a, a microphone or anything like that. So that being the case, the, the man Pilate said, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. And the people yelled, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. So there was significance there. Then, then the second question was, what shall I do then which is Jesus who is called the Christ? And the people yelled, crucify him, crucify him. So Hey, Justin, Justin, you can come out. Justin, did you hear me? I was mumbling, and then I heard crucified rabbits from that place. Come over here and sit down. That's all I wanted you to hear. Very good. You caught it exactly. Because there in the fortress, he would not be able to hear the question, who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Christ? Instead, what Barabbas heard was, Barabbas, Barabbas, crucify him. That's enough to understand that, okay, I didn't draw. I drew the short straw. They're going to take me out. They're going to kill me. So when they came to take them out of the prison, they removed two men, and they looked at Barabbas. And this is the thing, guys, that you've got to get to heaven for. We all got, we want to know what happened to Malchus. We've got to know. Did he pull on the ear the rest of his life, or did he make it to heaven? We've got to know what happened to Barabbas. Because the scripture is silent about his life. Now there's some history about him. But, but it's not enough for us to pick up on. But what happened to Barabbas? Knowing that Jesus, an innocent man. They've already got the word out. This man's innocent. This, uh, he's a healer. He's a, he's a blesser of others. He's God's son. Over his name. Over his cross. The king of the Jews. Barabbas had to see all that. He had to see that. And yet he heard Barabbas, Barabbas crucify him. Kill him. And so when he comes out, you've got to realize that man had to be one of the most happy men of all Israel when he came and realized, hey, they weren't talking about me. Then Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was started. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, and Barabbas heard it, let his blood be on us and on our children. So when he heard Barabbas, crucify him. His blood be on us and our children. He knew he was a dead man. You know, literally, and I close with this, he was the man who missed the cross. He should have been crucified. Uh, he, he's guilty of murder. But the, the same forgiveness. You know, the Scripture says they cast lots. They cast dice for, the, for that, that whole gamble of life to get there and realize that you're going to be the innocent man. Maybe he's just a little side part of the story. But I think it's a very significant part of the story. Uh, I've, I've heard this statement before he took my place on the cross. This is how I feel about being Barabbas, that I've been guilty of sin. I've been guilty of death. Uh, listen, Jesus didn't know more than to say that he, they, they said he blasphemed by saying I'm the son of God. Well, if, that's, if that'll get you uh, death, a death sentence, imagine where we're at. You know, we're all guilty. And here's Jesus taking Barabbas' place I think somehow, poetically, I, I kind of wish the Scripture would have went that made Barabbas carry the cross instead of Simon. It didn't happen. I didn't write the story. Amen. I just interpreted it, re reading it, and preaching it. Then he released Barabbas to them, expecting soldiers to come, take him, beat him, 
nail his hands and his feet to a cross. Barabbas, heart pounds with the terror that would soon visit him back. To his surprise, they released him and told him another has taken his place. Stand with me. I started out with Joel. Mercy. If we turn back to him. We went to Hebrews and realized that I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help whenever I need it. I, I, I walked through it. I realized it. And I, I only picked out Jonah getting a second chance. I only picked out Samson getting a second chance. I don't want to ask us how many times we've had a second chance. But I'm telling you right now, we serve a God of a second chance, no chance, fat chance. You know, I mean, he's the God that takes care of us in so many ways, looks after us. And, and I pray those watching online can catch hold of this also tonight to understand that God will give you another chance. He'll give you another opportunity. The greatest thing to me about the gospel is knowing I serve a God of another chance, that I can start over again, that I can pick up myself, you know, and, and, and keep on pressing on. Don't have to just waller in it. A second chance for a man whose place was traded. My mind wonders about his destiny. How that Gabbatha, the courtroom, gave him a pardon. And here we see Jesus again. You know, he knew how this thing was going to work out. He knew what the people were going to do. The people got their way. God got his in the last. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for the faithfulness of those that are here. And Lord, I pray that you would bless and strengthen them for their service tomorrow. And God, I also pray that if there's any way that you could help, help out tonight, the Rockets. Uh, we need a little help with the referees. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I love you.